Any questions based on the discussion we've had so far? Yeah. Do many people get the feeling that they've got something itching under their skin? Yeah, that, that's, that probably goes with the carcinoid skin. Uh, the question is, do many people get um, sensation uh, the itching sensation under their skin? Like you're really itching and you can't get at it. Yeah. And the, you're seasick. Seasick? No yeah. sure. I got it back. <laughs> um, look, that's... That, We'd put that in the category of one of the more non-specific symptoms. It possibly could be related to the syndrome, or it may not. Um, um, itchy skin, um, I've had some patients complain of it, but they don't necessarily have to have diarrhea or hot flushes. No, I had none of that. Yeah. I just had really itchy skin, and they gave me some, I called it cement. <laughs> <laughs> you mix it with water and drink it, and it cures the itch. Probably styrene. But were you yellow at the time? Yeah. Yeah, so you were jaundiced. So that often can go with jaundice where the skin gets itchy. Okay. Um, that's the cement product that yeah. you have. Yeah. Good job. Next one. It's a question of them. Um, you talk about being prone to serotonin and paraganglionin in relation to any differences or similarities. I'll just repeat that. Could you talk about theochromocytomas and paragangliomas in relation to differences or similarities? Compared to other nets, but that's that's a good question, and uh, I guess and it goes back. The on the panel. Yeah, so <laughs> it goes back to the first first point I made that this disease is not one disease; it's a variety of different conditions that are all lumped under the title of neuroendocrine tumors. So there is a whole spectrum of diseases that have that feature of being endocrine, meaning has some features of cells that make hormone, but they also have some neuronal features as well, so it's called neuroendocrine. <coughs> so uh, pheochromocytomas are um, tumors that start in the adrenal gland, but again, they're, they're also not the same. So some of them are very low grade and they just sit there and do nothing. While there are malignant pheochromocytomas, it's about 10% of the cases, they metastasize and they cause a specific syndrome of increasing blood pressure, headaches and palpitations. So the patient could present with a blood pressure problem that's not controllable with blood pressure tablets. That could be the first presentation of the disease. And that's very different from a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor or a neuroendocrine tumor in the small bowel. And the paragangliomas are also very specific. Uh, their genetic makeup is very different from other neuroendocrine tumors. And the treatments we use for, uh, let's say, a small bowel or a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor do not work in paragangliomas. So it's incredibly complex. And some of them in the pancreas, they, depending on the cell of origin, they could make insulin. So they will be an insulinoma. They could make an enzyme called VIP. It's not a very important person. It's a <laughs> vasoactive intestinal peptide. And when make, they make that, that hormone, um, the gut starts losing fluid in enormous quantities. So they get a diarrhea that's not controllable with any medication. And these, these syndromes are very complex, especially if you're not familiar with them. So if that patient ends up in a, in a community hospital and they think it, it, it behaves like cholera, essentially. So if you don't think of it, you won't make the diagnosis. So the acronym for neuroendocrine tumors is NETS, and one of the pathologists internationally calls them nearly everywhere tumors. Yes. As essentially that's <laughs> <laughs> Just to, to this last observation, my question is uh, the variety of uh, terminology that uh, surrounds the, the disease uh, between tumor, uh, carcinoma, uh, carcinoid, um, and, and the, the, I think that it would be helpful in what the information that you send to the GPs or to, to make them more aware to have what, if there is one, an international uh, really terminology that, that define, denotes the, the different kinds. Because I, when you first mentioned I've got NET, um, well, a lot of GPs, I'm sorry, had never heard of it. Uh, and then when you go through the scans, uh, then maybe you say, oh, this is not a tumor, it's a carcinoma. So it's, you're a neck, you're not a net. 
Um, <laughs> and at that point, so you're trying to figure out the best you can, where you stand or where to ask for help. And um, uh, you go through the scans and, and then you read somewhere because maybe Facebook or all other this information, they say, oh, have you had a GA 68? <laughs> what is a GA? Well, now, yeah. and I, from what I understand, the GA 68 is not for grade one and two, is more for grade one and two and not for grade three. But here now from Katie's uh, excursus <laughs> and voyage, <laughs> um, I think she was, she did a, a, a GA 68 and she's grade three. So I find... Because grade three is about 20%. Yeah, but I mean, this I think is something that GPs probably and Australia. Um, I think we all we all like to classify diseases into categories. So we put them in. This is the corner of G1. This is the corner of G2. That's the corner of G3. But reality does not follow textbooks. So in many cases, you have a G2 that has some G3 elements, and you have G3 that has G2 components. The diagnosis is made on, a base, on the basis, usually on the basis of a needle biopsy. So a radiologist sticks a needle into part of the tumor and they take that sample out and examine it and they read the rate of division of the cell and they call it G2. But that needle might have gone to part of the tumor that's not the most aggressive. So in order to make an accurate diagnosis, you need both the biopsy and also the gallium scan and also the FDG PET scan. If you don't do all of them, you do not have a complete picture. But to your point, there is an international nomenclature and it is confusing. We find it as well because pathologists often change some of the more complex ones. But the, there are ones that are fairly black and white. There's the grade one, and it's up to 2%, 2 to 20% grade two. And then you have G3, 20 percent up to now it's 55 percent and then there's the ones that Mustafa alluded to in the beginning the neuroendocrine carcinomas which are put above 55 but you can't use that score alone to try to predict what's going to happen as what Mustafa was saying you need to look at the total information you have to try to understand and if a patient is known to have a disease you have a period of time where you've watched the journey you get a sense of the, 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 the direction in which the tumor is going and when we first meet someone, we don't know that. We've caught them in a snapshot in time. And we really, we may hear from them that they've had a history going five years of diarrhea or flushing or other symptoms. But we're then trying to predict what's going to happen forward. We need all the information to try to make that the emphasis of what's going to happen forward to try to decide the degree of treatment that we should undertake. Just an addition, this again from Facebook, from Facebook and from group of necks, uh, everybody asks, what's your KI-67? <laughs> all, of, all of these you learn as you go, but you really don't know at the beginning. And so what is this KI-67? So should, who should I ask? Then you ask your oncologist or your GP. You say, how do I learn about the KI-67? I mean, this is where I think that the Unicorn <coughs> Foundation, which I think is great because uh, are doing really a fantastic job to, to make it to spread, to spread the, the knowledge or the awareness around, um, is where maybe these also these things, because the patient is very confused when you know you are asked the question and then you ask it, you ask the doctors. And they say, mm, I don't know where it takes a long time before you actually arrive at what is the KI-67. Uh, and that is probably important for to say whether you are grade three and how to deal with. I don't know. I mean, this is just yeah. general. The, the Unicorn Foundation is going to be putting together fact sheets. And those are the sort of things that we'll have readily available so that you can just go online. This, you don't have to go through a whole book and trying to find things. It'll be well documented and easily easy to find uh, for all those things. And with the GPs, there will be the modules that we will put together so that they have more of an understanding so they can then explain to you rather than you going into them and explaining to them. So, 
So in the interest of um, full disclosure, I'm a scientist who works here with the, the team at the far end of the table, um, and I'm part of Sydney Vital as well. But I thought um, it's been alluded to by a number of the panellists, and it might be worth just making the point. Um, can you, Paul, Nick, uh, John, can you just give us an update of where Australia is travelling at the moment with this, with the management of this disease, relative to people that we often compare ourselves to, like Canadians, Americans, New Zealanders, the British, and so on? Because I think we've got a great story to tell, and it's really, really useful for the audience to understand just where we're at. And Paul, you, you talked about governance and things, and I. And, and dealing with government, so you know a lot about this. So. Well, it's something that happened to government. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I don't represent government. <laughs> yeah. um, um, okay, so that's an interesting question, and I guess. Um, thanks, Dale. It's an interesting question. One of the things that has become very clear to me as we go to different um, meetings around the world, for instance, the ENEX meeting or the American meetings, and that is how far behind the Americans are and how far ahead we are. Um, we're in a research collaboration as well with New Zealand and Canada that uh, Nick talked about earlier. And that's really interesting when we start to talk about how we do our imaging. They have not had gallium dotatate scans. Um, in Canada, it's very hard to get them. New Zealand started to get them. We are so far ahead. And the old scanning that they do is something called an Indrium octreotide scan. Now, I haven't seen one of those for 20 years, but they're, they're terrible. I mean, the, these PET scans are just so much better. And so it makes it really, so just keep that in mind as you look at Dr. Google and so on. It don't, don't go to any American websites. So I'm sure the, the patient things, are, the support things are good, but in terms of um, really where, where we sit, we are so far ahead. And so really it, it's, it's, it's uh, Europe and particularly places like Germany, the Netherlands and so on, and Australia. We, we really are well, well, Europe, Sweden's part of Europe, yeah. Um, they are, you know, we are so far ahead of where, where many countries are. Similarly in terms of lutate therapy, now, lutate's been around for 20 years. It started in Europe, again, in, in the Netherlands. And um, uh, Germany's been uh, doing quite a bit. It's been available at Peter McCallum, uh, St George. It's certainly now available and funded in Australia. It's very hard to get lutate in the United States. And um, similarly in Canada, it's quite limited where you can get it. New Zealand, I don't think you can get it at all. So just, uh, you know, I think it is an important point to make. And why is that? It's, it's a combination of things. Partly is our regulatory environment. Part of it is, I think, that there are um, clinicians that are very keen to provide the best care that we can. And I have to say, it's also largely related to the likes of Unicorn and John. Um, I know when we were, fun, were trying to get Lutate funding up in New South Wales, we were not, we were, every roadblock that was possible was being put in front of us. That was with, with us going through the usual channels with the, the bureaucrats. Um, so we all work together. We can, I continue to do that. We continue to do that. John went around the back and got straight to the politicians and, <laughs> and was relentless in, in uh, what he was bringing up in Parliament or getting brought up in Parliament. That's the way you do it. That's the way you have to do it. We, knew, we know that we had the science behind us. We know we have the evidence, but it just needed a bit of a political angle as well. So it does take, it's a team effort. So, you know, the, the clinicians and researchers are one part of it the patient advocacy groups and, and the political lobbyists are another part as well. So, so I think to, to answer your question, at least from a, an imaging viewpoint and a nuclear medicine therapy viewpoint, just we, we are very, very well placed. And I guess our focus now is the people who, who should get Lutate, for instance, get it. You know, our, our role now is to try and do these trials so we can work out when, you know, what point of a treatment, at what point of a journey, you know, what are the indications when we should go ahead and be treating? When do we wait? When do we not wait? Uh, like in Katie's case, you know, we're keeping a very close eye on her. We know that how her disease behaves, so we really want to be ahead of the game, not not behind. Um, but not everyone's like that. Other people, we're quite happy to do a scan once every year, once every two years. It's they behave very differently. So these are the things now that we're working on to try and work out the appropriate timing and um, and sequencing of all of our different treatments. Thank Sorry, you. I've answered that very long. But, um, um, I just want, I, I want to echo what Paul said. What we have in Australia, and to answer Dale, and to reassure you all, is a community. We have a community of dedicated and passionate doctors. Uh, we are supported in Australia by pharmaceutical companies who are at the forefront of looking after you, not trying to push anything. So we get a lot of support and kind for all our education and, and whatnot. Um, we are now, through the Unicorn Foundation, I guess we're creating a community of potent patient advocates and we just need you all on board. And through that, 
when novel and new treatments come through, we'll be able to hopefully lobby the NH and MRC to get big grants for studies. Uh, we need you to get involved and, and put your hand up for our patient uh, quality of life apps and, and our databases, because that's the only way a small number of us can create a big space and lots of noise. And I think throughout Australia, in every single state and territory, there are committed physicians all in a very collegiate, and surgeons, um, and anaesthetists, um, <laughs> who are very much committed and communicating to the, for the best outcomes of their patients. The US is very siloed. Um, Europe's very siloed. They, you know, the, the lack of collaboration is, is there because they want to protect their IP, whatever they're doing. But here, we're, we're, we are really spearheading, thanks to the passion of many of the people on this uh, table, as well as those outside the room. Add to that, if, if you look at Sydney Advisor, which is a, a, a translation of Cancer Centre, it started only four years ago. And the object was to facilitate research, to improve collaboration. Um, and what we're seeing here is actually one of the outcomes of the funding of CNSW on how you could improve or facilitate research. So one of the concepts of Cindy Vital is that what we're actually really interested in and we think is a niche for uh, the Northern campus, if you like, is it's a broad term, but it's functional imaging of diagnosis and treatment of cancer. So we actually don't want just the anatomical information of a CT scan, which it says, oh, there it sits, or there is where the, the problem is. If you do functional imaging, which is dotated FEG, for example, you actually get a really good feel for how that tumor actually behaves and how it behaves to treatment. And in that sense, it's actually becoming a model for how we look at treatment of other cancers. So actually, we're really in front in terms of functional imaging uh, of disease, uh, in terms of management and diagnosis in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which I think is unimaginable if you looked at it 10 years ago. One of our um, junior doctors who's done a PhD in the, in the through Sydney Vital had led a paper uh, that looked at the scoring system to incorporate both these tests. It is now getting a presentation at the European Neuroendocrine Tumor uh, um, annual meeting next year uh, to workshop that because we had the, uh, the current president come over and observed, sat in our MDT and watched what we did. I thought, wow, we could learn from this. And, um, the, you know, the, what we lack in Australia is not the effort, the passion, it's just the size. And one of the handicaps we have is, is getting, becoming centres for some of the clinical trials is often difficult. Um, and I'm only saying that for that. And so we have to work hard at trying to create our own trials. Lobby for funding can be difficult uh, because there's a lot of preconceived ideas and, and everyone in this panel has had to cop that. The preconceived ideas about um, uh, uh, the disease not being common enough or, or not being significant enough to, to be worthy of funding. And that's one of our challenges. And only through, I guess, lobbying and, and through concerted effort can we change that. <laughs> we, we, we would like half of that money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a question, I think. How much cooperation and competition is there between the cancer research system? Like we're currently on chemos and we have the dimension to accommodate. Yeah, just asking how much uh, cooperation and um, collaboration is there between <coughs> and competition between the various cancer research centres. It's a good question. Um, I'll answer it in part, but perhaps others can make a comment. Every every research centre has its strengths, um, and um, ours uh, evolved in new endocrine tumours through strong interest in surgery, through nuclear imaging, through endocrine endocrinology, and it's been over a long period of time. Uh, the King Horn Centre has its strengths in some other areas, some other rare tumour groups. Not everyone can do the same. We don't have the population where each centre can do everything. I mean, we're only a few kilometres away from each other. And I think in Australia, we could probably do better at recognising where there are strengths to concentrate those strengths and, and, and to, um, I guess, work more, um, interaction, interact better. In our multidisciplinary team meeting, we invite uh, 
paid clinicians from other parts of the state to present their cases. We do get patients from as far away as Lismore, Orange. Um, patients can't be expected to travel here for all their care. The doctors there present the case, we discuss it, we give advice back. And then when there's a change, we bring the patient back and the patient then goes back home under a, a recommendation and a pathway of treatment. From a research point of view, um, um, the same issue arises. If you have a rare tumour, you can't have every single hospital wanting to put their hand up to run that trial. It doesn't make sense. It makes sense that the centre that has the greatest population to run that trial and have referral to it. And what I think you're referring to in collaboration is to refer across to each other where there is a trial most suitable for patients. Currently, the Garvin's running a trial for the most trial is doing um, genetic testing for patients of a variety of tumour types. And it's the only trial of its kind affecting many tumours where we can't have access to that technology. So we're sending patients to them. You know, but you, you know, not everyone thinks that way, unfortunately. And stuff or others want to add? I think if you look at what Cancer City New South, New South Wales are doing, and New South Wales at large is trying to, is build larger collaborations. One of the examples, for example, where you, if you put tissue from a tuna, tumor and you freeze it, you can store it indefinitely, and that's called biobanking. Um, and what NSW has sort of conceived is that there should be actually a central biobank where across NSW we store samples of patients that are open for competitive research. And with competitive, I mean, you have to have a, a bloody good a research plan to get access to that precious material, but it's it's so it's more centralised. So there's more a vision on how collaborative research um, should take place. And if you look at, for example, University of Sydney, where we are located as a centre of uh, as a research centre, is is actually the same sort of thinking of we have to go bigger without losing identity, but have to go bigger in terms of collaboration. So University of Sydney, for example, is Western in Westmead. Central, RPA, and us. And we are then combined in a larger collaborative group, which is called Sydney Health Partners. So there, there is a lot of thinking, I have a feeling, that goes on into uh, towards more collaborative efforts, so upping the volume of rare tumours, but also upping the volume of infrequent tumours. But there's still entities of those frequent tumours uh, that are rare and need a collaborative approach. Can I just, just one final point on that? You, you note that in New South Wales, uh, lutate therapy is only available here and at St George. And that's probably a very sensible thing. It, it's a bit complex what we do. You need, obviously, a lot of people that have got the skills that understand it. And the more you like anything in life, the more you do of it, the better you get at it. So, you know, I think um, uh, that's a sensible decision of government. The, the scientist down the front is actually a physicist. He's involved. We do a lot of... Um, quantitative work on these scans. We're looking at uh, overall dose. We're looking at the kidney dose and, and so on. So you really do need those skills around you. So I think that sort of as you move into these rarer tumours, it does make sense that not it's not offered on every corner, but really in the centres of excellence. And for, for New South Wales, that's here and um, St George. There's a question there, and then I'll add the, answer the question on the board. Um, oh, my exam <laughs> Is there somebody you would recommend in New Zealand? You should see Ben Lawrence in Auckland. To be working with <laughs> Ben, ben Lawrence in Auckland. Um, I've had a the dotate scan done in Auckland. Um, I'm from Rotorua, and working with um, my oncologist actually has worked here at Royal North Shore. Um, so in Auckland, they have a, a neuroendocrine um, team. Yes. Ben Lawrence is one of the oncologists uh, who's very interested in the diseases, doing research in this area. Um, yeah. He hasn't trained here. I think Mike, Michael Finlay trained at RPA, right? Yeah. Yeah. So probably it's so, Michael Finlay, who is the same team. So it's the same group of people. We, we so can I have? Again. Can you write their names down and I'll pick them up at the end? end because <laughs> Ben Lawrence, like. Ben and Lawrence. Yeah. Um, so Ben is Ben. So what, what's unique in New Zealand is Ben has actually set up a national registry, which actually is something that's being set up here through the Uniform Foundation and the funding from Ipsen to do the same in Australia. And he's also collected. Um, he's been doing it for several years now. He has data 
going over a long period of time, including material from the patients to look at their genetics of their cancer and uh, in, the, in the biobank that um, Alexander discussed. So, uh, and we are collaborate, we collaborate with Ben. We're going to be sending some material to him. And, and one of the studies that I've been involved with, Ben's leading one of the biologic sub-studies of that study. So I'll give you a name afterwards.